All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for participating in our virtual online uh, Campbell breakfast uh, seminar today. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have Steve Epstein as our speaker. Uh, Steve is a litigation partner at Pointer and Sproul, where he's been practicing law for nearly 30 years. He's tried many jury trials and non-jury trials throughout courtrooms in North Carolina and argued numerous appeals. Since 20, 2015, Steve's primary uh, legal practice is focused on the areas of divorce and family law. And in addition, Steve has found time to become an author. So he has written uh, Murder on Birch Leach Drive, uh, which he's gonna talk about today, which I have, it's, a, it's an excellent book. And he has also written a second book, Evil at Lake Seminole, which uh, will be published uh, June 15th. Pre-sales are available on Amazon. So um, again, wanna really appreciate everyone participating this morning. Um, if you've not emailed your bar number to Colleen, email it to her uh, by, I think she said nine or 9.30 this morning. Uh, in, in talking with Steve and working through this, I don't think we're gonna have time for questions today. He's got a, um, he's got a full hour pack for us. So um, welcome everybody, good morning, and uh, glad to turn it over to Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to try and zoom through this very quickly because this actually, uh, the Bar Association, uh, the North Carolina Bar Association asked me after this book came out to consider designing a, um, a CLE around the book, which I did and uh, delivered that CLE at the Bar Association in January, which now seems like about five lifetimes ago. Um, but it's, it was a three hour CLE. And so there was a lot more to it than I'm going to be able to get to today. Uh, so I am going to try and whip through pretty quickly um, what I put into that presentation uh, so that you get the most benefit out of it. Um, the reason why this does set up as a nice CLE is because there was really excellent lawyering involved in this criminal case. Uh, and I'm going to highlight and showcase some of that for you this morning. Uh, in order to be able to really follow along, y'all were sent a one page uh, document that, that's called trial themes. Um, I, call, I will call that a bingo card throughout the uh, presentation, and it will be helpful for you to have that bingo card close by as I get uh, further into the presentation. I'm going to begin by reading uh, the last four pages of chapter one of the book, uh, along with some of the crime scene that's going to show on the screen as you uh, see uh, what's going on um, in order to orient you to the case. And then I'm briefly going to discuss, again, using some illustrations, uh, Jason Young's alibi so that you can understand the lawyering and the strategy that went behind the lawyering. So I'm going to start by reading from the last four pages. Um, there we go. Hope everybody can see November 3rd, 2006, hopefully. It was about 1.15 p.m. when Meredith pulled into South Raleigh's Enchanted Oak subdivision and turned into the driveway at 5108 Birchleaf Drive. Even though it was bright and sunny that afternoon, the lanterns atop the brick pillars at the driveway entrance were still lit. Odd, Meredith thought. She also noticed the gate to the backyard was open, which also seemed strange because the young's dog, a black mixed lab named Mr. Garrison, would often be let out into the fenced in backyard and allowed to roam free. Meredith parked her Honda Accord by the front walkway and approached the front door, where she was able to hear Mr. Garrison whimpering from inside. She reached for the house key on her keychain, then remembered she had recently given it to a friend to feed the dog while she, Jason, Michelle, and Cassidy were in New York. Not a problem, she thought. She went to the back of the house where a door she thought might be open led into the garage. But when she tried to open the door, it was locked. Meredith then recalled the electronic garage door opener wasn't working. She was able to manually lift the door just high enough to slip inside. She was surprised to see Michelle's silver Lexus SUV sitting in the garage. She was supposed to be at work. Weird, she thought, her concern beginning to grow. As she walked through the unlocked kitchen door, Meredith spotted her sister's brown purse on the floor against the leg of a small desk at the far end of the kitchen. Michelle, Meredith called out. Michelle, no response. Something wasn't right. She quickly climbed the stairs leading to the second floor bedrooms, 
her heart beginning to beat faster. As she neared the top of the staircase, out of the corner of her eye, Meredith could see dark red streaks in Cassidy's bathroom to the right of the upstairs landing. There were red stains on the bathroom floor too, as well as on the hallway carpeting. The more closely she looked at the stains, the more bewildered she became. They were actually tiny footprints, Cassidy's. Perhaps her little niece had gotten into Michelle's hair dye and made a mess, she speculated. Michelle must be pissed, she thought. Meredith then turned to face the master bedroom, directly across from Cassidy's bathroom. On the left side of the room, bright red spots were splattered across the walls, all the way up to the ceiling. Oh my God, she cried out. Near Jason's closet, a red liquid had soaked through the white comforter on Michelle's side of the bed. Red splotches dotted her pillow. Alarm now reaching a fever pitch, Meredith glanced at the floor between the closet and the bed. There, below the most concentrated red spots on the wall, she was confronted with the most horrifying image of her entire life. Just to the left of the bed, face down in a large pool of red, lay the lifeless body of her sister. Frantically, Meredith reached for the cordless phone on the nightstand next to the other side of the bed. She had barely punched in the numbers 911 when something else startled her, a rustling from under the covers. To her astonishment, Cassidy wriggled out from beneath them and began staring at her intently. Amazingly, her niece appeared unharmed. She was wearing pink fleece pajamas with no socks, diaper, or underwear. In view of the tiny red footprints on her bathroom floor and hallway carpet, she appeared shockingly clean. Cassidy lunged toward her aunt and hooked onto her hip like a koala bear as the 911 dispatcher came onto the line. I think my sister's dead, Meredith exclaimed. Oh my God. As she gave the dispatcher her name and sister's address, routine information gathered during all 911 calls, Meredith finally realized that the red streaks, spots, and footprints throughout the second floor weren't Michelle's hair dye after all. Oh my God, there's blood everywhere, she shrieked. Was Michelle conscious, still breathing? The dispatcher asked. No, I don't think so. Should I try to help her? Meredith answered in a panicked tone. In her shock, she hadn't checked for a pulse. She then touched Michelle and remarked despondently, she's cold. Did you see what happened? The dispatcher inquired. Meredith replied she didn't know, but there were blood footprints all over the house from her daughter's little footprints. I just came here on a fluke. I usually, you know, don't come here during the day. She shouldn't be home. She should be at work. The dispatcher pushed Meredith for any details that could explain what had happened at the ghastly scene. I don't know. I have no idea, Meredith said. There's blood all over the place. Cassidy, still clinging to her aunt, who she called Emmy, then chimed in. Emmy, Emmy, there's blood. Can you get a washcloth? Meredith interrupted. Did you see what happened to mommy? Did she fall? In her little voice, Cassidy explained the situation the only way she knew how. She got boo-boos everywhere. Meredith took her niece to her room, as the dispatcher instructed, and told her to stay there. When she returned alone to her sister's side, the dispatcher asked her to try CPR. She was told to turn Michelle onto her back, but budging her sister's twisted, lifeless body proved impossible. She's so heavy, I really think she's dead, Meredith said after several failed attempts. She's ice cold. Her body is stiff. That chilling revelation prompted the dispatcher to halt any life-saving efforts. Oh my God, I really don't know what happened to her, 
Meredith whimpered helplessly. Was anything unusual, out of place, the dispatcher probed. As Meredith surveyed the bedroom, she remarked, this place does not look like it normally looks like. There's blood in the bed. Also, Mr. Garrison had been freaking out when she arrived, she noted. Another thing out of place, though Meredith didn't notice it at the time, was that the wedding and engagement rings Michelle always wore, no matter how much she and Jason argued and fought, were nowhere to be found. An operator from the sheriff's office then joined the line. He had more questions. Meredith told him she was at her sister's house and had found blood everywhere. Turning her attention to Jason, she mentioned he traveled quite a bit. I spoke with him last night. He's out of town. He's on his way to his parents' house. Normally, my sister goes to work early and takes Cassidy to daycare, Meredith continued. You know, like today, something's not right. Cassidy was very smart for her age, she said, and seemed to be saying that someone had been in the house. Still gathering basic information, the sheriff's operator asked for Michelle's age. 29, Meredith responded. Was Meredith aware of any personal problems Michelle might be having, he asked. Meredith thought for a moment, then responded, um, not really, you know, her and her husband fight a little bit, but nothing too ridiculous. It was at that point that another realization set in, this one hitting Meredith like a prize fighter's blow to the gut. Michelle wasn't the only victim of this savage attack. She's about four and a half months pregnant, Meredith sobbed. Oh my God, oh my God, I can't even believe this is real. Like the two of them play jokes on each other, like my sister and her husband. Like I almost thought it was a joke. That's how over the top it seems. Something's not right. All right, so we're now gonna talk very briefly about Jason's alibi. Jason was staying at the Hampton Inn in Hillsville, Virginia, uh, because he was heading for a business trip where he had a meeting the following morning in Clintwood, Virginia, which was much further north and west from even Hillsville. So he basically tried to break up his trip into two, roughly two and a half to three hour um, portions. So he stopped in, for the night in Hillsville, Virginia. And the security cameras at this hotel show him checking in just before 11 o'clock and then going to the elevator, his room was on the fourth floor. And then at midnight, if you look at the bottom of the screen, Jason is back at the front desk wearing different clothing than he was wearing at the time he checked in. And then another security camera on the bottom right sees him leaving the hotel with something in his hands uh, literally just a few seconds before midnight. The prosecution's theory was that Jason then got into his white Ford Explorer and drove all the way back to his home at 5108 Birchleaf Drive, uh, which is about two and a half, two hours and 45 minutes away from the hotel. So the investigators who were investigating this very shortly after November 6, 2000, November 3rd, 2006, started doing the math on whether Jason had enough gas to be able to do that. They were very quickly able to determine he filled up uh, right after he left Raleigh before he headed to Hillsville, Virginia. So he would have had to have made that trip three times, the 170 mile trip to Hillsville, back to Raleigh, and then back to Hillsville again would have been 510 miles. And they found out that the Ford Explorer that he was driving held, two, held 22 and a half gallons. And the math on that made very clear that Jason would have needed more gas. He would have run out of gas before getting back to the hotel for the second time. So they started, the investigators and sheriff's office started canvassing gas stations between Raleigh and Hillsville to see if anyone possibly spotted Jason in the early morning hours of November the 3rd, 2006. And they eventually wound up at a gas station in King, North Carolina, just south of the Virginia border, very close to Pilot Mountain. Uh, it, this was the Four Brothers convenience store, and they eventually um, spoke to a woman who was a third shift worker who was working in the early morning hours of November 3rd. 
That woman's name was Gracie Doms. She also later was divorced and she became Gracie Doms Bailey and then she got remarried and she was Gracie Calhoun. Uh, for our purposes, we're gonna call her Gracie Doms Bailey. Uh, they spoke to her and asked her, did she see uh, a white Ford Explorer at the gas station? Uh, around, and she said that around 5.30 that morning, uh, she recalled seeing a white Ford Explorer and that there was a man who had been trying to turn on the pump, which was turned off because of the early morning hour, and he had to come in. And then when he came in, he was irate that she wouldn't turn the pump on. And he cussed at her and eventually threw a $20 bill at her. And then she, she was shown a photograph. And that photograph was of Jason Young. And she said, that's the guy. That's the guy that would cussed at me and threw the $20 bill at me. And voila, the prosecution had a case. They had Jason Young in a place where he never should have been at 5.30 in the morning, the morning his wife was killed, and the math and the distances and the time all worked out. So that was Jason's alibi, and that was the prosecution's uh, response to Jason's alibi. And now we're going to talk about trial themes. And that's really what this presentation is fo focused on, is trial themes and why we have trial themes and how to effectively use trial themes, irrespective of whether your case is a criminal case, a divorce case, um, or a bankruptcy case. It really doesn't matter. What is a trial theme? Here's my version of what a trial theme is. A trial theme is really nothing more than a compelling idea, an idea that is compelling enough that it can persuade. Whether it's a jury or a judge, it's got to be capable of persuasion. A trial theme is going to be supported by a collection of evidentiary facts. Think of it essentially as an umbrella, and under the umbrella are all the facts that support the umbrella itself. A trial theme needs to be familiar to jurors if you're trying a jury case based upon everyday life and common sense. It's a way of simplifying things. Examples from the Jason Young case, the two most dominant trial themes used for the prosecution, it was that this crime was not, could not have been, definitely wasn't a stranger crime. A stranger could not have committed this crime. And for the defense, it was the absolute lack of forensic evidence connecting Jason to the crime scene. Those were their two number one trial themes, but we're gonna see more in just a moment. So what's the purpose of a trial theme? Why do we need trial themes when we try cases? And my best, the best way I can explain this is to have you all think about a house, whether it's your house or somebody else's house. A house has so many things in it that if you, were to if you needed to describe your house to somebody else, you could probably go on for 20 minutes talking about everything in the house, all of the furniture, all of the food, all of the clothing, and on and on and on to the point that whoever is listening to you is bored to tears and will not remember anything that you say. A trial theme gives you a way to help your audience remember what you're talking about and for a jury to remember it when they're going back into the jury room. And it's very simple. Using my house as an example, I'm going to just simply label three of the rooms in the house as basically an analogy to a trial theme. And all of a sudden, we've taken something that seems very convoluted and very cumbersome, and we've simplified it simply by calling three rooms in the house, mom and dad's room, Joe's room, and Sally's room. And I don't even need to start describing to you what's in mom and dad's room because you're probably already able to picture that for yourself. You know, there'll be a large uh, master bedroom suite, they'll have a large bed, uh, they'll have normal adult things in their room, there may be a book lying on a night table where mom might be reading. Um, Joe's room, the little boy in the house, he'll have some sports things in his room. Uh, in his closet, he'll have boys clothing and on and on. And then Sally's room the same, you might find dolls or a dollhouse or whatnot, but you have a way of instantly basically getting a hook into what it is you're trying to convey. And that's what a trial theme is. You're wrapping other things, which are evidentiary facts, around something that's broader and easy to understand, which is your theme. So going through a quick list here, the purpose of a trial theme is to create a larger structure around which a collection of evidentiary facts can be organized. And that allows the jurors to have an overarching framework to recall what is important. Recall, remember that jurors in a jury trial 
are coming in from all kinds of different walks of life, and they really do not want to be there. They are never going to be as enamored of your case as you are. They're never going to be as familiar with the facts in your case as you are. You can't just spout at them a bunch of facts. They're not going to remember those facts. But if you give them an overarching framework, aka a trial theme, then you give them something that can help them remember what is important. A trial theme allows you to make your central points more accessible than a bunch of seemingly disconnected facts. Again, using the three rooms in my blueprint, that was far simpler than understanding everything that might be stored in each room. Understanding the significance of three trial themes is far simpler than understanding dozens and dozens of facts. Most facts are simply not going to be remembered in the jury room. No matter how much you think you're drilling them into the jurors' heads, they're not going to be remembered. Your themes are far more likely to be remembered and discussed in the jury room. It's the classic battle of forest versus trees. And unfortunately, trial lawyers frequently lose the forest, your themes, for your trees, which are the facts. All right, we're gonna talk about trial themes that were used in the Jason Young case, and we've already alluded to a couple, but now we're gonna go through a list of six on each side. And this is actually what is on your bingo cards, those six trial themes. So for the prosecution, the number one theme was that this couldn't have been a stranger crime. Why? Michelle was savagely beaten, sustaining more than 30 blows to her head and upper body. And also there were signs she was strangled. There were no signs of any break-in. Apart from her wedding and engagement rings, nothing else of value was stolen from the premises. Not only was her two-year-old child found unharmed, that child had been cleaned up by someone after she had walked through and played in her mother's blood and was found asleep and safe in her parents' bed. What stranger does that? Motive, which is always going to be a significant theme in a murder case, uh, Jason had a deteriorating marriage with his wife, Michelle. It was very well known that their marriage was not in good shape, and it was made far worse by an oppressive mother-in-law, or at least someone he thought was oppressive, and divorce wasn't an option, at least in his mind, because Michelle and her mother hailed from Long Island, and he believed they would wind up going back to Long Island, and he would never see his daughter again. Jason was having extramarital affairs with at least two women, one of whom he had spent his anniversary, anniversary weekend with in Florida rather than being with his wife. And a third woman who was a former fiance, just a couple of months before the murder, he had expressed his undying love to her. So all of that played into motive as did the fact that there was $4 million in life insurance on Michelle's life. Guilty mind was another significant trial theme for the prosecution, which you could also label consciousness of guilt. Jason refused to speak with law enforcement or even his family members in, year, in the years following his wife's murder. He wasn't arrested until over three years after the murder and would never talk with anyone, not law enforcement, not his family, about his whereabouts and what he did in the 24 hours preceding the murder. He also never called law enforcement to find out what was going on to solve the crime. There was also a wrongful death case that um, his, uh, aunt, his uh, sister-in-law and mother-in-law filed against him, and he never responded to that, resulting in him defaulting. He didn't fight for custody of his daughter. They also tried to get custody of his daughter and did, and he eventually just gave up custody of his daughter rather than having to testify about anything that might be related to the murder of his wife. Uh, his calls to his, uh, to, to his sister-in-law, Meredith, and his mother, uh, he called them both to make sure that somebody went to the home while he was up in Virginia, contending that there was uh, some pieces of paper that he had left behind that he wanted to make sure Michelle didn't see. Those types of calls where he tried to get somebody into the house were also very important to the prosecution in showing that Jason had a guilty mind. Um, his hotel was a very significant trial theme because there were so many pieces of incriminating evidence at the hotel. Uh, one of which was his change of clothes, which we saw, the security camera showing him leaving the hotel at midnight. There was a security camera not far from that same area that was tampered with 20 minutes after he arrived at the hotel and at 6.35 the next morning. 
And there was also an emergency exit door that had been propped open with a rock that was found early that morning. All of that pointed to something very strange happening at that hotel, just ironically, the same morning his wife was murdered. Uh, eyewitness, and that gets back to Gracie Doms Bailey. Uh, she wasn't a strong witness, but she was basically a slam dunk witness for the prosecution if you believed her identification of Jason, because that was no different than witnessing the murder itself if Jason was where she said he was at 5.30 that morning. And finally, the shoe fits. Though almost every item of forensic evidence in the crime scene was unhelpful to the prosecution, uh, there was one singular piece of evidence that was very helpful. There was a footprint made in blood very close to Michelle's body that turned out was made by a size 12 hush puppy shoe. And it just so happened that Jason had purchased and owned such shoes uh, and they, the prosecution was able to demonstrate that the sole design on the shoes he purchased matched completely the bl bloody shoe print. Turning to the defense side, uh, as I said earlier, the lack of forensic evidence was their number one theme. Apart from the bloody sh shoe prints, there was literally no forensic evidence placing Jason at the scene of the crime. His body was unscathed, even though the medical examiner had testified there was a struggle between Michelle and the assailant. There was not even a speck of blood in his truck, uh, in his luggage, or in his hotel room, uh, and yet he had a very compressed timeline to do all of the things he had to do in order to uh, make this murder happen and not be detected, and somehow was able to clean himself up well enough not to get a speck of blood anywhere. The compressed timeline is another theme all by itself. Uh, we know that he had at most six and a half hours to get back to the hotel if that 6.35 a.m. tampering of the camera was Jason. And that would have left him approximately 90 minutes in Raleigh at the crime scene to have done everything he did, including killing his wife, cleaning himself up, cleaning up his daughter, and getting out of the house without leaving any incriminating evidence on himself or in any of his belongings. Other people involved was another important defense theme. There were unexplained DNA um, swabs and fingerprints in the bedroom and on a medicine cup. Not only were there the hush puppy bloody footprints, there was a second uh, set of bloody shoe prints with a different size shoe. There were eyewitnesses to the house and eyewitnesses to other people in the house um, at er in the early morning hours that morning, most prominently a woman named Cindy Beaver, um, who was a postal worker who worked just down the street. She testified in both trials that she had seen not only a vehicle coming out of the driveway at about 5.30 that morning, which couldn't have been Jason based upon the timeline, but that she saw people in that vehicle. So that was a significant part of the other people involved theme. Flawed investigation, which is a very common theme in a, def in a defense of a murder case like the O.J. Simpson case. So Jason's lawyers would focus in this case on the flaws in the investigation. There were things found in the house long after the crime scene was released. Cigarette butts, a hair found on a picture frame. Michelle's teeth were found in the house after the crime scene had been released. And the DNA from the cigarette butts and the DNA from the hair on the picture frame did not match Michelle and did not match Jason. There was also what the defense lawyers would contend, there was a ruthless and relentless focus on Jason to the exclusion of all other suspects much like the OJ case. And then finally, there was the identification by Gracie Doms Bailey of Jason, not through a photo lineup, not through a live lineup, but by the suggestive selling of sticking a picture of Jason in front of her and asking, is this the guy? The next theme was that Jason was a seat of his pants kind of guy, a whimsical personality. And their theme was this guy wouldn't, wasn't capable of doing something like this, pulling off the perfect crime. He flew by the seat of his pants. And finally, as in most cases, the defense was going to focus on the burden of proof. They would hammer away on all of these other problems, suggesting that, that the prosecution could not prove Jason guilty of killing his wife beyond a reasonable doubt. So how do you use these trial themes to win your case? You know what they are. Now you need to know how to use them to win. And it's very simple. And I'm just using the Jason Young case as an example. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to amplify and emphasize and highlight and help the jury understand your trial themes. And you're trying to, in every way you can, 
eviscerate, eliminate, or make less significant the other side's trial themes. So in the Jason Young case, all of the prosecution themes, the prosecutors wanted to amplify in, at every turn, while at the same time, through cross-examination and in other ways, limiting or blunting all of the defense's trial themes. Not surprisingly, the defense is trying to do the same thing with their trial themes and trying to eviscerate the prosecution's themes. All right, so now we're ready to start watching um, a portion of the Jason Young trial. And we're gonna start with opening statements, but I do wanna say a few words about using trial themes effectively in opening statements before we start watching. So what we're trying to do with opening statements, just as I said, is amplify your affirmative themes. And you're gonna obviously talk about not all of the facts, but the key facts that support each one of your themes in your opening statement. And you want to begin the work of chipping away at the opposing themes. How do you do that? Well, by providing the jury with alternative facts that explain those themes in a different way, or by providing the jury an alternative explanation for facts that seem at first blush to be helpful for the opposing party, but if you provide a different explanation, perhaps they're not. You obviously want to motivate jurors to help them understand why the case is important and why they should care. You also, in an opening statement, I believe it's critically important to start previewing weaknesses. Every case has weaknesses, every single case. Your case will, you want to preview those weaknesses in your opening statement to blunt the force of the unfavorable evidence that you know is going to come out. You want to begin by explaining why it does not affect the ultimate outcome. And you also, by explaining weaknesses in your own case, you actually get something really positive that you need to win your case. You get credibility because of your candor with the jury. You're more likely to be believed as the trial proceeds because you've been honest with them. We're gonna start with the prosecution's opening statement. This is actually in the second trial. This is Assistant District Attorney, now Superior Court Judge Becky Holt, and I'm gonna stop her because I only have limited time. I'm gonna stop about halfway through, but here's a very small portion of her opening statement, and we're gonna talk about it after we're done. summer into the fall of 2006 that it was like a pressure cooker and the pressure was increasing because as part of the plan for Michelle to be able to go back to work. I'm going to fast forward it. I just remembered I wanted to start right about I'm here. Operator. What she had seen and what she was seeing. <coughs> Her niece was unharmed. Her sister was dead in what wounds the medical examiner would later describe as inflicted by at least 30 blows. What Meredith Fisher would later learn <coughs> is that through the medical examiner, is that there was evidence of strangulation and there was evidence of at least 30 blows of an object to the head, to the front of the face and to Michelle Young's head. The blood in that bedroom in the area where Michelle Young was found goes almost to the ceiling. It was a brutal, personal beating. The, what you'll learn during the course of this trial from Meredith and from the investigating officers that arrived was that there was no sign of forced entry to that home. There was no broken window was no pride open door. And what was missing were the rings for Mrs. Young's hands, her engagement diamond rings that she wore were not on her hands. 
and she was found. They traveled and got here, and he learned once he got there that the police wanted to talk to him. But before he had even gotten back to Raleigh, he had contacted a lawyer. He refused to talk to the police. That day, and in the days that followed, <coughs> He refused to talk to his family members. He refused to talk to his friends. The information that the investigators were able to uncover was not as a result of a man who has been told that his wife has been, his pregnant wife has been murdered in the home with their two and a half year old. The information that they were able to get was not through any information he provided. It was not through answering questions about any enemies Michelle Young may have, any problems she may have had, any things that might be missing from the house, any of the last conversations that he may have had with her. It was not, not only information not provided, but what you'll learn is that he didn't even call to ask what was going on in the investigation. In the days, weeks, months, years that followed, a man whose wife has been brutally murdered in his home does not call to say, what does your investigation reveal? What is going on? During the course of this trial, you'll learn that as time went on, the defendant cut off or at least severely restricted the visitation that Meredith and Linda had with their niece and granddaughter Cassidy. That as a result, they went to see a lawyer and said, we want a visitation schedule. We want to be able to see Cassidy. And that as part of that process, that the defendant turned over physical custody of his daughter. Rather than answer questions, submit to a deposition, rather than talk about what questions were had about his activities, he gave up his daughter. You will learn that there was a civil suit, a wrongful death suit filed in which the allegations were that the defendant murdered Michelle Young. You will learn that instead of responding to that lawsuit, Instead of responding to those allegations, the defendant defaulted. He didn't answer. Because that would have required him to submit to deposition to answer questions. Okay, so looking at your bingo cards, um, the first question is, and if we were together, I would actually look for a show of hands, but I'm not going to be able to do that. First, uh, we're going to ask, what prosecution themes did she amplify? And I'm going to tell you, she amplified, obviously, not a stranger crime, 30 blows to the head and face, strangulation. She called it a brutal, personal beating. She mentioned that there was no forced entry, that Cassidy was unharmed, and that the only things missing were very personal, wedding and engagement rings. She also focused in the six minutes we looked at 
about Jason's guilty mind, how he contacted a lawyer immediately and never talked to the police, his family or friends, and didn't even ask about the investigation, and how he gave up custody of Cassidy and didn't respond to the wrongful death complaint to avoid answering questions. What defense team themes did she begin chipping away at? And I will tell you that not only in this six minutes, but also in the entire length of the opening statement, she really didn't. Uh, and that uh, unfortunately was a mistake and you're gonna see uh, in a moment how the prosecution would pay for that mistake. And then the same mistake was made by not previewing or minimizing weaknesses, uh, not only in the six minute clip that you saw, but that really wasn't done. And you're gonna see, especially if you go first, how that could really backfire uh, when the other side uh, does their opening statement. So we're now gonna move um, into the defense's opening statement delivered by Mike Klinkasum. Again, it's going to be, I'm gonna truncate it down it for you. no coincidence that in the state's opening statement, they didn't mention anything about any physical evidence linking Jason Young to the murder of his wife. Think about that. Not one thing was said. What the prosecutor didn't tell you is that during the investigation at the scene, there were two different sets of footprints that were located in the bedroom in Michelle Young's blood. Two different sets of footprints that the prosecution has never been able to definitively match to any shoes Jason Young owned. What the prosecution didn't tell you is that at the scene of the crime in the house and in the bedroom, there are fingerprints that remain unidentified. You will hear that during the course of the investigation, the City County Bureau of Investigation lifted prints, latent fingerprints from the scene and tried to match them to over a hundred different people that had been in that house either during the Young's marriage or during the investigation. And there are prints that remain unidentified. And what the prosecutor didn't tell you is that that jewelry box that she mentioned where there were two drawers missing, the jewelry box had DNA on it. The day CCBI, the City County Bureau of Identification came out to process this crime scene, they did a DNA swab on the jewelry box and the state sent it off for testing, both at the SBI lab and at a private genetics lab called LabCorp. And LabCorp found DNA on that jewelry box that didn't match Jason Young and it didn't match Michelle Young. That was her jewelry box. And there's DNA on there that doesn't match either of them. This case has never been solved, ladies and gentlemen. And Jason Young did not murder his wife and his unborn child. Again, think of the coincidence that the state didn't mention any of this physical evidence. And that's really because in this case, ladies and gentlemen, there are two types of evidence that you're gonna hear about in this case. The first type of evidence is objective, rational, logical evidence based on common sense and scientific investigation, forensic scientific investigation. You're gonna hear about evidence concerning DNA. You're gonna hear about evidence concerning serology, which is the study of body fluids, particularly in this case, blood. There was a lot of blood in this crime scene. You're gonna hear about fingerprint analysis, hair and fiber analysis, footwear analysis. And this case is going to involve in a certain way physics, not not heady math related physics, but the physics concerning time, chronological time and geographic space. Because what they're trying to have you believe is that Jason Young drove all the way to Hillsville, Virginia, almost three hours, drove all the way back to Raleigh in the early morning hours, <clears throat> killed his wife in the most brutal and one of the most bloody ways possible and somehow got back got out of the house without getting any blood downstairs and not one drop of blood in his truck, in his Ford Explorer, not one drop of blood back in his hotel room when he supposedly went back to get the receipt out from under the door, not one drop of blood anywhere on him 
in his vehicle or in his room, in his hotel room, and no transfer of hair or any fibers from his hotel room into the house. That's the one type of evidence you're gonna hear, the logical scientific evidence. Then there's the other type of evidence that you've heard a lot about, which is based on emotion. And ladies and gentlemen, I am not here to tell you that Jason Young was a good husband. He was far from it. He was not ready to get married. He was not ready to have a child. And you are going to hear about <coughs> sexist remarks, juvenile behavior, you're gonna hear that he acted like an obnoxious jerk, okay? You're gonna hear about parties he went to where he got drunk, one event where he urinated on his friend's rug, his friend put him in the shower to try and sober him up, and he comes running out of the shower and sits on the sofa in front of everybody naked. You're gonna hear about that. You're gonna hear about how he got drunk at the NC State tailgates. You're gonna hear about fights he had with Michelle. There were, there were loud arguments with Michelle and the one the prosecutor was speaking about at, in Winston-Salem in October, that was a bad one. There is no question about that. But you'll also hear that after it was all over, he hugged her at the reception, kissed her and told people, I love my wife, she's crazy, but I love her. It was not a good marriage. There is no question that it was not a good marriage and that he's acting like a jerk. You're going to hear from <clears throat> his former girlfriend. They've already told you how he tried to reach back out to her through an email. You're going to hear about how they had um, a physical altercation at a wedding reception where he pulled an uh, engagement ring off her finger and how later they made up and he gave it back to her. There is no question that he's acted like an obnoxious juvenile jerk. But what you've got to remember, ladies and gentlemen, is that we don't convict people of murder just because they sometimes act like jerks. We only convict people of murder when there's proof that they committed the crime, when there's proof of it beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, I'm gonna cut it right there. Um, and we're gonna, again, ask the same questions we asked of the prosecution's opening statement. What defense themes did Klinkison amplify? Well, he amplified a lot. That was six minutes, and he amplified a lot in those six minutes. Obviously, his number one theme, the lack of forensic evidence. And he began his, what he said by saying there wasn't one thing said about that in the prosecution opening statement. They didn't acknowledge that at all. Not one drop of blood. He hammered away on the lack of forensic evidence talked about the compressed timeline, how it was three hours each way, that may be a little bit of a, an embellishment, but he talked about that. Uh, he talked about um, how Cassidy was shockingly clean after playing in her mother's blood. Well, that's hard to do if you have a very compressed timeline. He said the time does not add up. Um, other people involved, he talked about the two sets of footprints, the unidentified fingerprints. Um, and he talked about the burden of proof just there at the end. We do not convict except upon proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So he had a lot of his trial themes just in the little portion of his opening statement that I played for you. What prosecution themes did he begin chipping away at? Um, motive. Um, he said, you know, despite all of these things, Jason still said, I love my wife. She's crazy, but I love her even after a really bad fight. Um, we didn't get to see much of, of the other themes he chipped away at, but he did and stuff that I didn't play for you. Uh, weaknesses previewed, and he, toward the end there, he did a, a terrific job of already foreshadowing weaknesses that he knew were gonna come out and he wanted to be the one to tell the jury about them. He talked about that Jason was far from a good husband, that he was an obnoxious juvenile jerk sometimes, that he drank alcohol in excess, that he had verbal fights with Michelle and even had a physical altercation with his prior girlfriend. Why? because you want to get the bad news out early, you want to take the sting out of it so that when it comes up, it won't sting, and you wanna buy credibility with the jury, which he did a masterful job of. Um, Cross-examination of lay witnesses. In the remaining eight minutes we've got, we're gonna do that real quick. Um, objectives of cross with respect to themes is to undermine the opposing themes and bolster your own, to damage the witness's credibility, and to use witnesses to make affirmative points. In terms of damaging credibility, you all know these things. You're trying to focus on bias, perception, memory, the implausibility of what the witness is saying, and use prior inconsistent statements to the extent you can to impeach. 
In terms of making affirmative points, because we have wide open cross in North Carolina, you don't need to restrict your cross examination to what was within the scope of the direct examination. You can ask about anything. And if the witness has knowledge of facts that will, helpful, that will be helpful to bolstering your themes, you want to ask those questions, especially if you know the witness will have to concede those facts or if the witness is pinned down by deposition testimony or prior statements. All right, we're gonna to get to one cross-examination and just a brief bit of it. Mike Klinkison cross-examining Gracie Doms Bailey. Good morning, Ms. Doms. Good morning. I just got some questions for you, is that okay? Okay. Ms. Doms, I wanna take you back to November 6th of 2006 when the officers first came to see you, okay? Okay. When they came into the store, they asked you if you had seen a white SUV a few days before, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let me saw them. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, when they asked you that, you told them you had seen a white SUV, correct? Yes, sir. And then they took out that photograph and showed it to you, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Ms. Doms, before they showed you that photo, they did not ask you to describe the person that you saw, correct? I can't remember if they did, but I do remember that. They asked me what happened, and that's about it. Okay, they asked you. They asked you what happened. Yes. But they, you don't remember them asking you, asking you to describe who you saw, correct? No, sir. Okay. Now, Ms. Doms, um, a few weeks ago, back on May twentieth, you were you were here in Raleigh, correct? Yes, sir. And we had a we had a hearing in this case, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And it was over there in the other courtroom. Yes, sir. Okay. And you were testifying then, correct? Yes. Okay. And you got on the stand and took the oath just like you did today, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And you were asked quite a few questions, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, ma'am, one of the questions you were asked was um, to describe the person that you saw that night, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And you were asked, is there anything else about him today that you thinking back at that time that you could recall, correct? Yes, sir. And one of the things you were asked was, was he bald headed or did he have hair, correct? Correct. And your answer was, I think he had a little bit, I can't remember right off the bat. That was your correct. answer, correct, about the hair. Correct. You said he had a, you thought he had a little bit. Correct. Okay, all right. Um, and then you were asked about um, the person you saw that night, you were asked about his hair color, correct? Correct. Okay, and you couldn't remember, you said, you were asked, do you remember the hair color, correct? Correct. And your answer was not right off the bat. Correct. Okay. Uh, you were asked, do you remember anything about the height, weight, how tall a person or heavy a person, do you remember any of that? And you, that was the question you were asked, correct? Correct. And you said he was just a little bit taller than me. Correct. Correct. And how tall are you, Ms. Thomas? I'm about five foot. You're about five foot. So this person was a little bit taller than you. Yeah. Okay. Ma'am, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the Four Brothers convenience store. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm and I'm I'm assuming here because I, I had not never been in that store. I'm assuming since you were the clerk, you work behind the counter. Yes, sir. You're over there with a the cash register. Yes, sir. And um, I'll just call it the machine that operates the gas pumps. Yes, sir. Okay. And you were actually behind a counter, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And so there's a counter where people can come up and put things down, correct? Yes, sir. And that was, I guess, was at least a few feet long, correct? Yes. And maybe a few feet wide? Yes, sir. Okay. In some convenience stores, Ms. Doms, it seems like the person behind the counter is standing higher up than the people on the floor. Is that how it was in Four Brothers? No, sir. Okay, so you're you're standing on the same on the same level. Correct? Yes, sir. Just you're standing behind the counter. Yes. And so there's some distance between you and the person. Yes, sir. Okay, and again, this person that you saw, you described him back on May 20th as just a little bit taller than you. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And having just a little bit of hair. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. 
So focusing on, and by the way, that was four minutes and 23 seconds. And I would say some of the most effective cross-examination that I've seen in four minutes and 23 seconds. Gracie is on the right, Jason's on the left. Gracie said he's just a little taller than me and she's five feet tall. Jason is six foot one. Gracie said he had a little bit of hair. And as you can see from the photograph, Jason has so much hair, he had difficulty during his trial testimony keeping it out of his face. Did Klinkasim damage the credibility of Bailey's identification? Literally four minutes. He didn't just damage it, he destroyed it. What defense theme did he amplify? Well, he amplified the defense theme of flawed investigation. What was flawed about the investigation? As I mentioned earlier, she wasn't shown a photo lineup. She wasn't asked to view a live lineup. She was shown a picture of Jason after she said, this man cussed at me and threw a $20 bill at me. And the deputy sheriff said, is this the guy? And she looked at it and said, yep, that's the guy. It's despite the fact that she's later gonna testify that he was about five feet tall and was bald. Prosecution themes undermined. Uh, obviously, the key prosecution theme undermined was the eyewitness because the eyewitness was literally eviscerated through the cross-examination of Gracie Doms Bailey. I am going to stop sharing my screen because I am out of time. I wanted to get done so that all of you could get on with your work day. Thank you very much for attending this Zoom CLE. The first time I have presented a CLE by Zoom wasn't too bad and I hope you all think so as well. Thanks for being with us this morning. Have a great day.